Hi everyone and welcome to Digital Live, Enabling Education Online, brought to you by Pearson here today and thanks for joining us on this gorgeous, beautiful, sunny day. Um, my name is Amy McJennett and I'm a Head of Digital and Assessment here at Pearson. And I think, if anything, the last couple of months have taught us it, it's just how rapidly the education uh, sector has needed to move in order to kind of deliver education online and switch that delivery model. And I think we've just been in awe here at Pearson at how our team teachers have been accomplishing that through collaboration and through experimentation. And so today is about bringing the best of the best together to share some of that inspiration and, and some of those insights and some of those tips about how to deliver effective education um, remotely. And so we've got an amazing lineup today, um, a real treat for you. Lots of um, interesting sessions. I'll run through a few of them to give you a, head, uh, a heads up of what the day is going to involve. Um, and then we'll segue into our keynote with Daisy Christodoulou. So um, we've got speakers from across the sector. We've got the Field Studies Council on their work in finding new ways of connecting learners. We've got Nick Brown and John Taylor on successfully implementing project learning in online environments. We've got five top tips on Microsoft Teams from Stroud College in South Gloucestershire, which is, is going to be great. And we've also got Helen and Rachel from Act On It having a creative conversation. And we've got Google running a session for us as well. And we'll be tailing the day with Ross Beamish from Wycliffe College on how students can use their own devices to create interesting digital content. So really, really diverse, but interesting agenda for the day, full of lots of um, vibrant sessions to give lots of inspiration and top tips. Uh, to support with that remote teaching. So it'd be great if you could get involved with us um, via social media. So do tweet using the hashtag, hashtag Pearson Digital Live. It'd be great to kind of see your comments coming through there. And likewise, there is a chat function for you. So if at any point during any of your sessions today, you want to submit a question for the speaker um, or the interviewee, just submit that via the chat and we'll get to that. And we won't be able to respond to them all possibly live, but if we can't, we'll definitely get back um, with responses. But we thought um, to get warmed up and to get started, we would begin with a little poll just to see how our educators are feeling. And I can I can see there's a large number of you who have joined us this morning already. So it'd be great to do a quick poll. So that's going to come up on your screen in just a moment. And the first one is around, have you seen any benefits of remote learning um, for your learners? So have you seen any benefits there for remote learning? I think we've all been worried, haven't we, that um, you know there is inconsistency in, in homes and, and students kind of logging on and some doing lots and some doing little. But I think also there's been some you know unintended consequences there that have been hugely, hugely positive. So it'd be great to see um, what benefits you feel students um, are, are having. The second poll that we're going to be asking you to complete today is what has been the biggest challenge for your learners? I think, again, we've seen lots in the press here, haven't we, about the digital divide and access to resources and, and just basic IT literacy that's we're holding, holding some of our students back and that disadvantage gap getting wider and wider. So it'd be great to see what you feel are the biggest challenges there for your learners um, of having your students and cohorts. The third poll is around just what you're hoping to get out of today. You know, this is our first event. I think originally it was planned to be delivered face to face as well. Um, and we've switched it to entirely virtual. Uh, and we'd love to continue this support. I think since school closures, what was it back in March, we've been working really hard here at Pearson to support our educators um, and make sure that we can give provision for free that supports them at a times of crisis just like this. But we would love to know what you're hoping to get out today so that we can refine that for our future events and make sure that these are spot on and have speakers um, that you want to hear from um, and things that you want to know more about. So just while you're completing those polls, we've got a few little housekeeping points. Some of them I think I have run over, but just to double check that everyone's aware, it's just if you have got any chat, if you have got any questions for us, submit them in the chat and they come through through to me and I can see them um, and therefore we can um, get those answered for you. So just submit them via the chat um, and we will follow up. But I'm going to segue now into our, our first speaker event, um, and Daisy's joining us, Daisy Christian, and she's going to be talking to us about how EdTech can be a force for good during school and college closures, which proves to be a fascinating talk. She's going to talk to us for about 10 or so minutes, followed by a Q&A. 
And uh, Daisy's the director of No More Marking, um, an online comparative judgment tool. And previous to that, she was head of assessment for art schools, where we both worked there together. Um, and she's just released her third book, Tech Versus Teachers, Teachers Versus Tech, I should say. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about some of the content within that book and how it can be applied to the situation we find ourselves in today. So I'm going to hand over to Daisy. And if, as you're listening uh, to this kind of insightful presentation, you want to submit any of those questions for Daisy, then, then do so. So Daisy, I'll hand over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Uh, really good to be uh, able to take part in this. Um, so I'm just going to uh, go over to my... Um, over to my presentation and I hope you'll all be able to see it. So uh, I hope you can you all see those slides? Um, so I'm gonna assume I hope you can all see the, the slides I'd like to I'll let you know if there, I'll let you know if there are any issues. No, brilliant, thanks Amy. Um, so what I want to talk about is EdTech being a force for good. And uh, as Amy said, I've just published a book about education technology, teachers versus tech, and I wrote the book before coronavirus. I had no idea that uh, almost just a week after the book was published that it would uh, all schools would be shut down and all, all learning would, would come online. Um, and I think in the first few weeks after the, uh, the lockdown, I think schools were focusing quite a bit on maybe emergency remote learning. I think as time has gone on, people are starting to think a little bit bigger picture about, about some of the issues. And so what I would like to talk about today is I've just picked out three themes which I think are... Uh, important themes uh, generally even before coronavirus, but I think which are particularly important now. Uh, and those three themes are uh, synchronous versus asynchronous learning, engagement and motivation, and exams and teacher assessment. And I'm really intrigued to see that in the surveys, uh, when you were talking about what your biggest challenges are for learners, uh, actually motivation and engagement was, was one of those. Uh, in fact, it was the, the biggest one by, by quite a way. So uh, I think that's a, a key issue um, we're seeing everywhere and, and, and you're seeing as well. So what I'm going to do, I don't want to spend too, too long on these slides. I just want to give a really high level overview of some of these issues and then have plenty of time to uh, have questions and respond to some of your, your comments. So I'll just take these one at a time and then we can, uh, uh, yeah, have a discussion afterwards. So. Synchronous versus asynchronous learning. This is something I'm hearing from a lot of schools at the moment as a, as a bit of an issue. So just to clarify the difference between the two, with synchronous learning, it's where the lesson is timetabled. It's where the lesson's happening in real time. So the teachers and students are all uh, are kind of present at the same moment. They might not be in the same place, but they're all, all there at the same time. And so video conferencing is a great example of, of synchronous learning. And certainly in the, in the weeks after the lockdown, a number of schools kind of did go online with essentially a timetabled synchronous video conference plan of lessons. But the, the opposite of that is asynchronous learning. This is where teachers are setting work. Um, the students are completing the work in their own time. The students work on it, send it back, and the teachers respond at different times. And so this is something, examples of this would be recorded lessons, work being set by email, uh, the virtual learning environments, work being set on there. And so you can obviously see the pros and cons of each approach. Obviously, the advantages of the synchronous approach are the teacher can get that feedback in real time from the students. The disadvantage is it can be difficult getting everyone online. Not all students have devices. Even if they do have devices, the, 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 the connections, the, the, the feedback you get may not be as smooth as in real time. The advantage of the asynchronous approach is that even if students don't have devices that are connected to the internet all the time, they can still access the work, they can still do the work. They're not getting that real-time feedback. And I think that's been a big challenge in different schools with different contexts and different levels of disadvantage, I think, have had to respond to what is right uh, for their context. So I think that's been a, a big challenge. But the one thing I want to talk about now is something that kind of sits in the middle of synchronous and asynchronous, which is adaptive platforms. And adaptive platforms are kind of doing uh, – they, they are asynchronous in that a student can log on and work on them in their own time. But – they are trying to replicate some of that real-time feedback that a teacher might give. And I'm just going to give an example of what I mean by this. So this is an example I've taken from an academic paper. Imagine an adaptive platform that gives a student a maths question. And imagine the student puts, as a first step, something that's not quite right. What an adaptive platform will try to do is to nudge the student or give them some hints and clues in the way that 
a good teacher might. So here's this example. Uh, if you, you, keep, you keep looking there. Um, you seem to have added two plus three. Is that really appropriate? Then another little nudge, uh, another, and then finally just actually telling the student what they, they should have entered. So that's a simple example of what an adaptive platform looks like. And actually, adaptive platforms, they really vary in complexity from, from one extreme to the other. You have some which have thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of questions. They're building up profiles of the learner, and every learner will have their own individual pathway through them. You have others which are, are a bit simpler. So the next example I want to give you um, is an example of space repetition. And space repetition platforms, they are kind of adaptive as well in that they, they are adjusting to the content that students find easier or harder. But they're, they're perhaps doing that in, in a slightly simpler way to some of the more complicated uh, platforms. So a space repetition platform, it's uh, a nice way of thinking about it is a, 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 there's lots of flashcard apps where you enter your digital flashcards and the app will display them to you at um, in ever-increasing intervals because that's the best way of recalling something for the long term. So they space out your repetition of the content. And every time you get a flashcard wrong, they will loop it back to the beginning so that you have more practice on that. So they're kind of adapting and personalizing to you based on the content you find difficult. So I'll just give a little example. Here's an example. Uh, let's say you're studying Shakespeare and you're actually really good at the Shakespeare flashcard and you're getting them all right. Um, so you can see that then you're getting these ever expanding intervals uh, because you're getting them right all the time. But let's suppose you're doing a flashcard about Elizabeth the first, and you really you struggle with that a bit more. Um, and let's say that once you get up to having uh, revised the Elizabeth the first flashcard a few more times, then you. Um, so sorry, it's uh, just uh, struggling to click through a little bit there. Um, Okay, so it's struggling to click through here the slides, but let's imagine uh, as you do start to struggle with, with 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 a particular question, it will just bring that question back to the beginning, and you have to revise it some more. Um, so that's the uh, that's how space repetition works. And as I say, it's probably a slightly simpler way uh, of doing ad adaptivity. Um, okay, so that's the the the, the bit about synchronous and, and, and asynchronous. I'll now talk about the second theme I wanted to talk about, which is engagement and motivation. And as you've said in the survey, that's a big issue for you. And I think that's a big issue for, for most of the schools uh, I'm talking to. What are the ways you can ad address this? And it's worth saying here before, before I, I think about the ways you can address this, it's worth saying this is not just an issue for school students. This is an issue for all online learning. And even before coronavirus, uh, universities who designed MOOCs, the, the big online courses that universities design, there's a lot of really amazing MOOCs out there, but one of the, the big issues people have always identified with these online courses uh, that universities do is they have very low completion rates. And the number of students who enroll, uh, who, who actually finish a course, is often a really tiny fraction of the number who, who begin them. So it's not just an issue for schools. This is an issue for all online learning. And obviously, one way you can address it is designing better multimedia content. And we've got to remember that a lot of this online multimedia design is in its infancy. So there, there probably are things we can do to improve the design and, and, and make sure that it's easier for students to follow the learning pathway. And another interesting idea is gamification. And you'll see a lot of popular learning apps will do this, building in competition often building in kind of social competition with your friends, giving very frequent feedback, rewards, badges, the leaderboards of that competitive uh, uh, streak, and streak records. So obviously maybe we'll do the Snapchat streak, but there's a lot of learning apps which will use uh, streaks like that as well. So uh, just recording every day you've logged in. So building, building it up so you never want to miss a day. You want to keep your streak going. Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit controversial. People feel, oh, is this being a bit manipulative? Um, but it is one of those things that can really work quite surprisingly well and, and can really get, get students engaged. Uh, and then the final theme I wanted to talk about was exams and teacher assessment. And obviously what's happened at the minute is exams have been abolished. <laughs> so we don't have exams and we've moved to really a very low tech version of teacher assessment, which is just involving teachers um, not even considering necessarily student work, but just uh, giving a grade uh, to, to, a, to, to, to a student. Um, 
And so if we're thinking about what are the ways that technology can help maybe in the future with assessment, uh, what are the ways that we, we, we could do more, more remotely there? I picked out two examples, adaptive assessment and comparative judgment. Um, so I'll just quickly run through those. Adaptive assessment, a bit similar to adaptive learning, and I hope my uh, slide is going to work here, but essentially what adaptive assessment is doing is every student will start an assessment with the same question. But unlike with a traditional paper assessment where every student is doing the same questions, an adaptive assessment, you're doing it on screen, and depending on whether you get a question right or wrong, you are given a different next question. So if you get the question right, you're, you're taken up to uh, a certain question. If you get it wrong, you're taken to an, an easier question. Um, and again, if you get the next question right, you are taken up to uh, an easier, uh, a harder question, sorry. And if you get it wrong, you go down, drop down to an easier one and, and so on and so forth. So um, hopefully you can get the, the impression from that. I'm, I'm sorry these slides are, are playing up a little bit, but you can get the idea essentially that an adaptive assessment is just giving students different pathways through really big, big banks of content. The advantage of adaptive assessment is possible to accurately assess students in um, shorter time than, than traditional assessments because students don't have to kind of waste their time answering lots of questions that are either too easy or too hard. The flip side of it is, that um, every student, they're not all sitting the same assessment. And actually that can be an interesting one. If you're thinking about high stakes assessments, you can get into interesting questions there around fairness. Is, is that what we want? Is, is that, what does that do for the public understanding, if you like, of, of the assessment? Um, and then finally, the final thing I want to talk about is comparative judgment. Now, full disclosure here, I work for No More Marking. Um, we are a provider of online comparative judgment software. But this is another te tech-enabled form of assessment. It's for open assessments like essays. And how it works is as follows. Uh, the traditional way of assessing essays is really to mark them against the rubric like this. With comparative judgment, you don't have a rubric. You have two pieces of writing alongside each other. You read them both and you say to yourself, which is the better piece of writing? And you make a series of judgments like that. You have colleagues who join in and also make a series of judgments. The comparative judgment algorithm combines them all and uses them to come up with uh, with uh, um, a measurement scale for every piece of writing. So that is a very quick whistle stop tour through a number, uh, uh, three different themes, and then underneath those themes, a number of different practical applications of technology in the classroom. And I think these different types of applications, I think these are applications which have a, a bit more potential than I think some of the approach in the past, which uh, haven't always, I think, been as, as successful as we like. And we have to be honest and say that EdTech, in that sense, does have a bit of a, a checkered record. But I am really confident that there are really good ideas, really good applications out there. And hopefully that if one good thing comes out of this current crisis, it will be that we, we start to think about these and, and start to use them. So I'm also going to put up there a, a little screenshot of my book. So I write about all of these issues in, in my book. Um, so that's something you can have a look at if you're interested in learning more. But I am going to finish talking there uh, and hand back to Amy. And we're going to uh, have a look at the, the questions you've been sending in. And we're going to have a chat about some of the things you think are important, some of the questions you've come up with. So, Amy, over to you. That's great. Thanks, Stacey. And I can definitely recommend read the book. It's brilliant. Lots of interesting stuff in there, um, some of which has been touched on there. And, and I think this point around um, adaptive platforms is a really interesting one. And I think teachers are very keen, but there is a trust element there, isn't there, Daisy? So, you know, where that content quite often has been preloaded by somebody else, that, that, that curriculum sequence, that pathway, it's adapting to content that a teacher hasn't necessarily put into that system. And one of the questions we've got here is are there kind of any great systems whereby you can actually put your own content in for that adaptive pathway? And I think that that is sometimes the crux of the issue for teachers is around that trust and wanting better to be able to customise and bespoke those solutions for their own curriculum. Any Absolutely. thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a really key issue. I mean, it is one I, I talk about at length in, in the book because I think some of the really sophisticated adaptive platforms, as you say, they do require a lot of trust from teachers. They are requiring teachers to give up a lot of autonomy or at least to kind of submit to the the order and the sequencing of an external program um and that may not be always what you want to do it may not fit in with, with the context of your school and what you want to be doing 
Um, the flip side of that, there are platforms where essentially uh, you can you can load the content yourself. But the issue there is that's often then an awful lot of work. <laughs> so, it, and, and often the individual teacher or even a school won't have the resource to really load in that much content in that way into, into a platform. So you have a, a you do have a bit of a challenge, there, a bit of a trade off. And one of the things I, I talk about in the book is about what your own resources are and what your own capacity is to take on change projects like that. I think if you want to start somewhere simpler, the flashcards I talked about are kind of a simpler place to start because they give you an element of adaptivity, but uh, and they let you set the work yourself. But it's a sim simpler than just ha having to redesign your whole curriculum and put your whole curriculum into an adaptive platform. You can just be adding a couple of flashcards per lesson, and, and, and that can be something students do for homework. So I would say for anyone wanting to dip their toe into adaptivity, that maybe looking at some spaced repetition systems, flashcard apps, is a nice way to, to start. Uh, if you want to get into it in a more advanced way, yeah, I talk about some of the, the, the different platforms in the book and, and the way you can you can do that as well. Yeah, that's great. And full disclosure from me as well. Um, we are at, we're in the process of um, of kind of piloting a new great adaptive um, platform, which tries to tackle some of these very issues. But we're looking for some um, early adopter schools to get involved, you know, for free, just to test it, to work with us, and to see what we can do. So, if, so you know, if you've tuned in today and you are interested in taking part, then you know, just let us know in the in the chat, and, and we can follow up afterwards. But I think absolutely trusting in that content and and that adaptivity is is kind of a real issue and I think that's perhaps held back some of the take up from teachers previously but this situation that we're in now is finding ourselves that transition period is happening. I think another kind of key question that's come through and this is something I'm really interested in is that consistency and provision across key stages, phases and subjects. So again with adaptive platforms you find a lot of them do centre around maths content for obvious reasons and we have you know deficits in other subject areas. So what are your thoughts on that as to why that happens and and to whether or not you think that might change over time in some of other subjects where we desperately need this kind of resource yes another really good point and the, the subjects where platforms have, have really been most advanced as you say maths and also foreign languages and the reason for that is there's kind of an agreed body of content and also quite a hierarchical body of content and so it's possible if an organization wants to develop an adaptive platform that is then a really big market for it. There's a lot of schools, a lot of students who will be able to use it because, as I say, there, there is agreement over, a largely agreement over the, the sort of sequence of how you would teach things in maths or in foreign languages. The issue you have in other subjects is maybe there's not the same level of agreement. There is just, just more variation people want to teach. So in the case of English, for example, even if people agree that they want to teach a Shakespeare play, well, there's 37 different Shakespeare plays. So which one should you do? So there's just more... I think, I think variation in, in what is taught in a, in a lot of other subjects. Same with history, um, and you look at the look at the GCSE history, the different the different uh, available for, for exam boards, uh, and alone even within one exam board, the different options and pathways are huge. So it's it, it's really hard to to build something that, that that can appeal to lots and lots of students, lots and lots. And I think that's that's definitely held things back. Um, so. I, th I think in some ways, some of that is, is, is hard to address. Um, and I, I think potentially perhaps one of the ways it will be addressed is if you have these adaptive platforms that are just the platform without the content and the teachers can add in their own content. I think that's potentially one way you can address it. The other way is finding the things about subjects which there, where there is some continuity or, or, or some, some, some unity or agreement and, and, and trying to do things there. So, for example, with English, maybe everyone's not going to teach the same, the same text in English, but... Um, obviously, there are things around grammar and writing instruction that, that, that have more uh, m more continuity be between schools, um, and, and perhaps there might be things you could identify in, in other subjects too that you would you would find that unity. So I think that's the challenge, and it and is it's definitely isn't an easy one to overcome. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And I think, again, it, I, your kind of phrase there previously around trade-offs, sometimes these trade-offs are necessary, aren't they? Around kind of, you know, choices and, and choices of content, but actually being able to reach students in new and useful ways which are having impact is perhaps more important sometimes um, that, than, than some of that content choice. So, yeah, interesting stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Another couple of quick questions. One is around gamification. 
So it has been quite controversial, hasn't it, in, in educator communities for a long time. Um, and it, if I'm honest, it, it surprises me to hear you championing it a little bit there. And, um, and it's it'd be interesting, yeah, to just unpick the journey you've been on there and kind of why, you know, how you feel that that can make a difference and, and why that's something that does need to feature, feature in ed tech moving forward to support our students. Yeah, definitely. So I think, look, we have to make learning engaging. And if, if it's not engaging, students won't learn. Uh, I think the problem is when you go so far down the road of engagement, you forget about the learning. That's the problem. So what you have to try and do, and the, the, the difficult thing that all teachers wrestle with, is to make it engaging without losing the essence of the content. So for me, it's, it's, I, I think there are approaches to gamification that, that can do that. And, and I think there are things like leaderboards and streaks and uh, rewards and badges that can really help with that. And you, you, they're not compromising the learning. You still have high quality learning going on. They're just trying to incentivize it. I think the, the problem comes when you've got games that don't serve a learning purpose. I think that is that is the problem. So I, I do think there is a line there. I think there's also another interesting thing, though. I would say, broadly speaking, I'm, I'm, I think the, the things like leaderboards, streaks, uh, rewards and badges, I, I'm, I think are, are, are pretty good. And I think that they're quite a lot of fun. And I think in some ways they are just digitizing things that schools have done already, you know, where they've had rewards and, 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 and merit points in, in class. Um, but I, I do think actually there is an interesting point, even with some of those, which I'm broadly positive about, is you probably do have to think a bit more carefully about are they being manipulative? Um, and I find it interesting that when it comes to Snapchat and their streak, uh, I think people are generally a little bit dubious about that because it does just feel they are just trying to manipulate children to get them to, to go on a, 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 and send messages. But people feel a bit more probably happier with, with when you have streaks for language learning apps. But, and I think that's understandable because a language learning app, you're thinking, well, that's something that's going to help the student in life, whereas maybe logging on to Snapchat every day is not going to have that same benefit. But I think there's a wider discussion in society at the minute about tech ethics and technology ethics. And it probably is something we just have to think about and be aware of as this area develops. And um, as I say, I am um, you know, fairly relaxed about those kind of tactics. I think often the students I see with them really like them. I think they do motivate them and I think there is a value in them. But it is probably one worth keeping an eye on uh, uh, as things develop. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that up to myself as well. I think people like having that data. They like competing against themselves and, and it can be motivational, can't it? And I think especially now we've lost that vibrancy of the school community, the school building, the classroom. You know, we need kind of motivation things more than ever to, you know, to keep and, and motivate students to keep on learning. Um, so, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, I don't know if we've got one more time for it. I mean, somebody has asked around how easy do you see it as being, uh, being able to implement streak motivational technologies I'm not sure we've got time for it now but um, I think it is a really good question I think what Daisy and I'll do there have been a number of questions that come through around adaptive platforms there's a lot of questions around that and there's also some around comparative judgment there as well and the differences there to, to kind of um, to adaptive assessment so what we'll do is we'll endeavor to follow up to the, some of those questions um, after the session and reach out to you directly if that's okay um, but as I say, do come and join us because I see we've got one minute and it just whizzed by and I knew it would. But I'd like to say a massive thanks to Daisy for coming along and speaking to us and sharing her insights with us. And, and you know, if you haven't read the book, um, you know, do go buy the book, read the book. Um, it's fascinating. And I think, yeah, more than ever, it's helping to contextualise the debate as EdTech kind of evolves in the current situation. I think we were all expecting a transformation in EdTech, but the current situation has accelerated that and amplified the need for it so it's it's really important you know for us to stay abreast of that debate and, and keep up so, so do reach out and um and have a read um and do follow us and come and say hello on social media um and hashtag the event hashtag pearson digital live um if you've got any comments there and i do hope you enjoyed the rest of your day we've got loads of sessions um lined up and a couple of questions in the chat have been around do i need to follow my links specifically for individual sessions and yes you do so whatever sessions you've signed up for you will follow find that link um, will it will have been um, emailed to you and you follow that specific one for that session but that is all from us so thanks for joining us for the keynote and have a great day thanks everyone thanks amy thanks everyone thanks, bye. thanks daisy bye, bye.